Let us be in a spirit of prayer. Loving God, we were born into this world alone. And in solitude, we will depart from this world at our death. And during the precious years in between, O oh God, may we enjoy the gift of countless opportunities to befriend each other. Thank you, God, for giving us space to grow, space to toddle and to fall, space to dance and to dream, space to be alone and to make and break connections, space to run toward one another or to walk away, space to love and to laugh, space to risk and to become. Make us discontent, O oh God, with the way things are in our world. Teach us once again how to blush for our tawdry deals, our arrogant but courteous prejudices, our willingness to use the rights and privileges that are unfairly denied to others. Jar our complacency, expose our excuses, get us involved in the life of our community and help us to find integrity once again, that we may in some way stay within the reach of your arms. We lift our prayer, O oh God, in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture this evening is from uh, the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. I'll be reading from the 20th chapter, verses 7 through 12. On the first day of the week, when we met to break bread, Paul was holding a discussion with them. Since he intended to leave the next day, he continued speaking until midnight. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were meeting. A young man named Eutychus was sitting on the window he began to sink into a deep sleep while Paul still talked longer and longer. Overcome by sleep, he fell to the ground three floors below and was picked up dead. But Paul went down, bending over him, took him in his arms and said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. Then Paul went upstairs, and after he had broken bread and eaten, he continued to converse with them until dawn, then he left. Meanwhile, they had taken the boy away alive and were not a little comforted. May God bless the reading of God's holy word. This is one of my favorite passages of scripture. And um, the first time I preached on it um, was for a minister's and mate's retreat that was being held. And if I remember right, the main speaker wasn't uh, there, and so they asked me <laughs> to do a sermon. And so the person who was reading the scripture right before I was to speak um, got up and he read the scripture. And tradition is that after this passage is read in a worship service, the person is to say something like, this is the word of God. And people respond, thanks be to God, or uh, may God add his blessing to the reading of this word. But this fellow, when he finished reading that Bible story, he turned to me and he said, Really? 537 pages in my Bible and you chose this one? <laughs> and I probably took more liberty with the text than I uh, should have that night. But I want to tell you the story the way I told it to them. Um, and it did irritate them in some ways. Um, the story takes place in when the church is, a, is just a baby church. It's just a little... They're just starting to come into their own. Uh, they're still meeting several times a week, not just on uh, one day. But uh, they meet, and they always meet in this upper room. 
because traditionally Jesus had had his last supper in that upper room. And whenever they met for worship of any kind, they would break bread because Jesus had said, you know, do this as often as you shall meet. And there was this fellow in the church named Eutychus, a young guy, probably a very, um, very loyal, dedicated young man to this whole new movement that was going on and probably a hard worker. And so I can imagine that Eutychus um, had gotten up early in the morning to go to work. Um, he probably worked from sunup to sundown, or as we said back in Indiana, from can see to can't see, or from daylight to half past dark. Or... He put in a full day, and he came home that evening from work, probably took a quick shower, popped some leftovers in the microwave, heated them up real quick, and then saddled his uh, camel and headed off to church. And when he got there, the parking lot was probably packed to the gills with uh, other camels, because Paul was in town. So he couldn't park his camel in, in the lot there. He had to park his camel down the street somewhere, about, about three blocks away. He didn't even know the name of the people whose house he parked his camel in front of. Hoped he didn't mind. When he finally got to the place where the, the church was meeting, he had to climb those three flights of stairs up to the upstairs. And he walks in the room, and, and Paul's already preaching. And the place is packed to the gills. I mean, the place is just full of people, and, and most of them had probably not showered like he had. And the place was reeking of all the bodies in this hot room, and there was oil lamps burning on the walls, and Eutychus didn't have a place to sit, and so he worked his way around to the back. It was kind of standing room only, and there was a window at the back. And Eutychus popped himself up on the windowsill. But maybe it was the heat of that room, or maybe it was the stuffiness of the room, or maybe it was Paul wasn't a very good preacher. I mean, they, they, the scripture says his speech was of no account. Maybe it was just a little bit of the cool breeze coming through the window, but whatever the case, Eutychus fell asleep. When I say fell asleep, I mean he fell asleep. He, he fell out the window. Fell out the window, and they say that when he landed, he was dead. And if there's one thing that preachers hate, it's people falling asleep in church. But when they when they die in church, that's something else. And so Paul called an intermission. And you can kind of imagine Paul telling the folks, you know, he said, you know, I'll be back in a minute. Y'all talk among yourselves. He goes down, and Scripture says he bent over Eutychus. And he brought Eutychus back to life. And then the people, I love this. Then the people that were there <laughs> pick up Eutychus and haul his tail back upstairs again. And he and Paul have communion together upstairs. And then Paul goes on and preaches till daybreak. But they, they carry Eutychus back to his house because they said that they were not, that he was not a little comforted. <laughs> When I, when I told that story to the ministers, my reason for telling it was that, well, there was a lot of stuff in the news back then about ministers and priests doing all sorts of things illegal they shouldn't be doing. And I wanted to express to the ministers that in light of all the sins out there, that I thought one of the greatest sins of Christians was that we were so bloody boring. And that the, the, the story of Jesus is not boring. The story of Jesus is life-giving, it's exciting, but we have gotten so bloody boring about everything. And I, I remember this, there was this girl that worked for us, uh, worked, didn't work for us, she volunteered in our church office. Uh, her name was Amy. She was a, a Mormon, and she was on the track team at Brigham Young University, but she volunteered for us in the office for one whole summer. And when, this, when the summer was over, I hadn't had a chance to really talk with her much, but I invited her to lunch. And we, we sat down at the, at the lunch, and I, and I told her, I said, I, I, the only thing I really know about Mormons is from a book. I said, can you tell me about your faith, what you believe? And her face lit up. I mean, it, it could have enlightened the Grand Canyon. 
And she started telling me about God. And when she talked, she didn't talk about God. She talked about my God. That's the kind of excitement that, that we all ought to have. But that's not what I wanted to talk about. Right? I want to focus just very quickly on two words. And those words are bent over. The scripture says that Paul went downstairs, Eutychus is dead, and Paul bent over Eutychus. The words that are used there are the same words that are used in the Hebrew scriptures when Elijah bent over a child who was dead and the child came back to life. It's the same words that were used when the prophet Elisha bent over that which was dead and brought it back to life. And it's very similar to when Jesus goes in the house of Jairus when his daughter has died and he reaches down over this little girl and brings her back to life. And it's also reminiscent of when the story of, of God having Ezekiel look out over this field of dry bones. And he asks Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel doesn't think so. But God's spirit moves over those bones and they all come back to life. It's not important if you believe any of those stories. But there is a truth in those stories that I think we have to hold on to. And the truth is that God's Spirit brings new life. God's Spirit brings new life. It, it's, it's like a, a frustrated gardener. You know, we, we, uh, the Twyla does this all the time. She's all upset because a plant's dead. And she cuts it off, you know, and next thing you know, it sprouts out new things and starts growing again. It's almost as though God's Spirit breathes over that little plant and it starts to grow again. It, it happens politically. Nelson Mandela was in prison for 27 years. He had served 27 years of a lifetime sentence. But God's spirit bent over that situation somehow. And he becomes the president of South Africa and receives the Nobel Prize. We live in a society that seems to have, have just fostered prejudice and racism. I believe God's Spirit can still bend over that society and bring it back to life. I think sometimes that our nation has lost its soul, but I believe that God's Spirit can bend over that and bring it back to life. I've seen marriages that were literally crumbling And in, in, in one case, the psychologist said to the couple who said they no longer loved each other, the psychologist said, love is not an emotion, love's a decision. And when those words were spoken, it was like God's spirit bent over that couple. And they've had a wonderful marriage. I've seen addicts who had literally hit, and hit rock bottom and, and whose friends and families had written them all completely off. But God's Spirit somehow bent over them and they were brought back to wholeness, to health. I love the stories in the Bible. Elijah and Ezekiel and Elisha and Paul. And I don't know if they happened the way it says. 
But the truth of the matter is, I know for a fact that God's Spirit still bends over us and gives us new life. Let us pray together. Lord God, we know there is still much life left in us. There is still a future in each and every one of us. So we would ask, oh God, that you allow your spirit to bend over us, that you allow your spirit to give us new life so that we might continue to give you glory and to give comfort to your children on this planet. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.